Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to do this session because I get to share some of my very favorite things in this session. Before I let you know what they are, I want to do one more of those word puzzles. So let's take a look at our document camera. And let's see what we've got here. Mm. Mm. I don't remember if I had a turtle on the last one. That's going to be a T for turtle. What word's going to have a T for the third letter? Hmm. This is an L for lock. Over here, we've got a lion. That's another L. Over here at the end is an elephant. So I'll put an E. Do you know what word this is yet? We've got an I for igloo. And one more T. Little. The word says little. I'm a little excited. Actually, I'm a lot excited <laughs> because I have something that's little to show you. This right here is a little watercolor set that has a lot of watercolors in it. And I'm really excited to show you how that works today. Watercoloring is something I enjoy very much and I'm sort of practicing how to get better at it. Um, I've done a couple paintings I can show you. Um, this is a painting of a California poppy. I painted this because it used to grow a lot in my grandmother's backyard. And then this is a painting of some evergreen trees when it's getting to be on sunset. You can see how they're silhouetted. Means they're, they're black against the light. So, watercolors are a lot of fun to work with. I am so excited for this first book that I'm going to share today. Um, as you can see, it doesn't have a dust jacket on the outside anymore. And it looks like somebody did some drawing on the outside of it. I'll let you in on a secret that somebody was me a long, long time ago. I got this book when I was about three or four years old from a friend of the family. So uh, the title of the book is Ura Urashima Taro. So I'll show you that on the dot cam. Just a moment, there we go. Okay. Urashima Taro is uh, based on a very, very, very old Japanese story. And it's been illustrated by George Sioka. And the painting uh, style on here looks a lot like other Japanese art that I have seen. It was adapted from original folk tales by Robert A. Goodman and Robert A. Spicer, and edited by Ruth Tabra. So a lot of people came together to make this book. One of my very favorites. It's got an inscription for my wife, Irene my daughter Mia, and my son Gen. I imagine all those people are grown up by now. There is still a fishing village on the rough rock coast of Tango no Kuni, the same village where Urashima Taro once lived. Each dawn with the Japan Sea golden yellow to the horizon, the fishing fleet sails out through the pass. In the spring, the mountains behind the village blaze pink with cherry blossoms around the red tori, the massive gate the fishermen use as the eye of the entrance to their bay. The summer sun shines hot on Tango Nukuni. In autumn, thick mists and fog wrap the boats with an illusion of being alone, alone in a world where there is nothing to do but set and haul nets 
and hold the tiller until arms ache and shoulders knot with weariness. So it was with Hirashi Mataro and his father and his brother setting out with a fleet every morning, sailing home at night with the red tori. In winter, the wind pierced through three layers of kimono, but each day, every season, the boats went out. For a boy like Urashi Mataro, there was little time to play. One morning, when Urashi Mataro stayed in the village to help his mother and grandmother, storm clouds gathered. Evening came and the fishing boats did not return. In worried silence, the three ate the dried fish, the pickled vegetable, the boiled rice, and tea that, like the hard work, never varied. The shoji doors began to rattle in the rising wind. Okasi, whispered grandmother. The typhoon roared in from the sea. Throughout the night, the old men and the boys, the farmers and shopkeepers lined the beach with torches, a tori of light to help the fishing fleet home. By morning, the storm had blown on. One by one, the battered boats limped over the horizon. Urashi Mataro watched and waited all day for his father and brother but the Arashima boat was among the three that did not return. Once again, the typhoon had left orphans in the village. Urashima Taro felt he had left his boyhood behind him. Next day, he took part in the special services held at sea. He was the only man in the Urashima family now. He no longer saw his old friends. When he had any time, he wandered the beach in lonely solitude. The boys in the village called him Taro the Quiet One. They told of how he had risked his life to save a young seabird that had been blown from its nest on the cliff. On the beach, Taro gathered stranded sea creatures to return to the life-giving, life-taking ocean. He thought much on these lonely walks about happiness. There seemed nothing in the life he knew to tell him what happiness was, nothing except perhaps his dreams. One day, while Taro was walking by the seashore, he saw the village children tormenting a huge old sea turtle. The helpless turtle was flipped onto his back. Two of the boys, dancing wildly, beat on his shell with pieces of bamboo. Stop, Taro shouted, stop. One boy raised his bamboo pole to hit Taro, but when he saw the great anger in Taro's face, he and the other children ran. With help from Taro, the huge old turtle slipped quickly into the water and swam away. A year of days passed with nothing special to mark them, but Ashima Taro worked. He ate, he bathed in the Oforo evenings, he slept, he rose to work again. One afternoon out fishing, Taro felt drowsy from the warm sun and the rocking of the boat. A voice called to him from the ocean. Taro, Urashima Taro. He looked up and saw the huge old turtle swimming towards the boat. Do you remember me, Taro? asked the turtle. Last year, you saved my life. Now I wish to repay you. I have told my mistress, the sea princess, about Taro, the quiet one. She is the daughter of the dragon king and has asked me to bring you to her castle. It's different from anything you have known, a place 
that human eyes have never seen. Eagerly, Urashima Taro climbed onto the turtle's back. Down, down, down they went into the blue-green water. Taro gazed with wonder as the great turtle swam through clouds of shiny fish. Squid shot by trailing silvery tentacles. Kelp forests a hundred feet high opened their waving arms to let them pass. The turtle plunged into the secret darkness of an undersea tunnel. Urashima Taro rubbed his eyes, half blinded, as they emerged into the whitest of white sand at the tunnel's end. Here, surrounded by cliffs of pink and yellow coral, was a castle larger and far more beautiful than the famous castles of Nagoya, Himeji, or Osaka. The pearl shell doors of the castle floated open. Welcome, Urashima Taro, said the sea princess. She was so strangely beautiful that Taro wanted nothing to do except look at her. The sea princess led Taro to a banquet hall where mermaids and eels balanced and danced on their tails. Needlefish swam in and out of black sea urchin spines. Blue-eyed hermit crabs waved their tiny claws in ecstasy. Delicacy after delicacy was placed before Taro. How many ways could there be to find delight? Urashima Taro's tongue savored tastes beyond imagination. His head spun from drink more powerful than wine. Incense and perfume filled his nostrils. His eyes feasted on the princess who danced for him alone. If time went by in this wondrous place, no clocks were there to measure it. One day, as he rested, Urashima Taro found his thoughts traveling back to Tangonukuni, his home and his duties. I know my grandmother and mother are worrying about me, he told the sea princess. I must go back to them for a while. The princess touched his forehead as if she would touch his thoughts. I hoped you would never want to leave me, Taro, yet I understand. There is something I must show you now before you go. Taro followed her to a room of the castle where he had not been. There were four doors, each marked with a kanji. These, said the princess, are the four doors of your life. They are of your world, my beloved, not of mine, nor of the special world we two have shared. The first kanji read spring. Taro opened the door. The whiteness of ume was everywhere. Sakura cherry blossoms were clouds of pink light. Taro's heart surged with joy. At the same instant, he was filled with sadness. Ah, oh, the sakura is so fragile. It falls with the coming of wind or rain. The second kanji was summer. From its threshold, the fragrance of ripe fruits, grapes, biwa, pe peaches, Figs perfumed the air. How satisfying, 
How beautiful! Everything tastes so delicious, said Taro. But harvest never lasts long. The western door, autumn, opened to Momiji, blazing maple, and a warm scene all browns and gold. Oh, this too makes me both sad and happy, said Taro. How quickly the autumn colors fade and go. The fourth door, the winter door, opened to frost and deep cold. Matsu, the sturdy pine, held a burden of snow on its long needled branches. The mountains were white. Oh, here is such quiet, such peace, Taro said. At the entrance to the castle, the turtle waited patiently to carry Taro home. As he prepared to leave, the princess gave Taro a box carved from pink coral that felt like satin. This is the most precious gift I can give you. It is the token of my love, Urashima Taro. Inside is a treasure not to be seen by mortal eyes. Keep it always at your side, but please, Taro, never open it. Urashima Taro was soon on the beach near his village. Sayonara, said the turtle, and disappeared into the blue-green depths of the sea. With the box under his arm, Taro walked towards the village. The trees, the houses, seemed so different. Where his own house once stood, there grew a giant pine tree. How strange, Taro thought. How could he have forgotten so quickly what he knew so well? Villagers came and gathered around him. They stared. Where are you from? One asked. Who are you? Another spoke up. Oh, don't you know me? I am Urashima Taro. No one by that name lives here, they answered. Wait, said an old man. I remember my grandfather once told me a story about a young fisherman. He too was named Urashima, but he drowned at sea 300 years ago. Taro turned in anguish from the villagers. Only the red tori and the mountains and the beach were still as he remembered them. He ran to the sea, overwhelmed with his memories the harsh good feel of a net in his hands, the pull of the tiller against his arm, the taste of plain rice, the relaxing heat of ofuro at the end of a weary day. Taro sat onto a sun, sank onto a sun-warmed rock. He thought of his grandmother, his mother, his little seabird, and wept. All that was left to him in this world was the pink coral box, the sea princess's gift, how he yearned to be back in her undersea castle. Forgetting her warning, he carefully opened the lid. A wisp of smoke rose from the open box. As quickly as the motion of light and air, Urashima Taro saw the pink fire of sakura, tasted summer fruit, touched the crisp leaves of blazing momichi. A chill seized his body. He began to tremble. His hair turned white. Wrinkles carved his skin. His legs shriveled and gave way. And then a feeling of deep quietness, deep peace swept over him. Like the red tori, the Ohaka still stands on the rough rock coast of Tanganukuni. Urashima Taro, Shako Hokai, is its legend. It is a reminder to men everywhere of Urashima Taro who left the life of the real world to seek the treasure of happiness in the sea.
even though it's kind of a, a sad story, it's also a very beautiful story. And I have a deep love for the illustrations in that book. I've loved it since I was very, very small. So I wanted to show you my watercolors. I've got some special watercolor paper, which is nice to have. Uh, but if you don't have it, you know, you can do watercolor on any kind of paper and see what happens to the paper. Sometimes you get different effects from different kinds of paper. I'm just going to take a sheet off. This paper is very rough. It's kind of got some cotton in it, like a little bit of fabric, but it's still paper. And it makes it work differently with water. So you can do watercolor and on it. Okay. It'll give us a little bit of light here, since it seems to be getting a little dark. Let's open up watercolors. If you don't have a set of watercolors, you can use things like food to dye with a little water in it, or you can take an old dry marker and place it in a little bit of water and that'll make some watercolor for you. And remember, I showed you how to do painting with chalk last time. So you, there's a few different things you can do if you don't have any watercolors at home. Now this set is a little bit fancy. It has a lot of different watercolors in it. But I also enjoy just a normal eight color Crayola. And you know, you can make all these colors by mixing. Remember what we talked about last time with the mixing of colors. I wanted to show you what it's like to paint on paper that is wet. It's called wet on wet painting. I have a special brush that's very large here. And I've got my little thing of water. I'm gonna start by wetting this paper. Get it nice and wet here. So I can show you what I'm talking about. I'll move my paints a little bit here. I'm feeling very inspired by some of the ocean pictures that were in that book. I think I'd like to draw under the sea, maybe some coral. Now I've got three brushes here. These brushes actually have water in them, so they're designed you can take them with you when you go traveling. All right, so my paper is wet. Now when you use watercolor, you need to, to dip your brush in water, or you have a brush that you could squeeze like this, but you normally drip the brush in water, get some water on the tip. And I think I'm gonna start with some, some bright orange. Well, no, let me do the background first. So when I do background, I don't do a lot of color so that it's light. Uh, let's do some blue. It's turquoise color. I'll build up some color. Now watch what happens. You notice how the color is fading and spreading out so the edges aren't staying very, very tidy or neat? And add even more water to it. Really want to add some, get this paper really wet so you can really see it. There we go. This paper can hold a lot of water. There we go. There, that's the effect I wanted. Or you just put a line, it just seems to kind of go everywhere. Excellent. Let's see. Change the color of blue that I'm using. A little bit of this one. I think I need a blue with a little more green in it. What do you think? Hmm. Or, oh, oh, this dark, dark, dark blue that looks almost black. Let's see what happens when I put that on the wet. Hmm.
Notice how it's very light. I don't have a lot of dark. And I'm letting it spread. See that? If you do that in a painting, it makes what you're making in the making on the paper look like it's in the background or far away when it's lighter. It makes something darker, it makes it look like it's closer. Take another look at my tree painting that I did. You notice how I did some light tree shapes in the back there and how it makes them look like they're kind of far away, hiding in the mist. And the same effect. Only where the edges were were sharp in that one, they're very fuzzy in this one. Very wet. Okay. Now, if I don't let this dry and I keep working with it, then anything I do is going to blend in with what I've got all there already. So if I change colors, something totally different, like, oh, let's say orange. You know I like bright colors in my artwork a lot of the time. See how the orange is mixing with the blue, making kind of a brown? We talked about color mixing last time. If you do wet on wet watercolor, the colors will mix, which is really exciting because now you're going to get a bunch of colors maybe you didn't know you were going to get. And you notice this is brighter and not as light, so it looks like it's in the front. I think it needs some red. What do you think? Let's go for some bright. Yeah. You notice how I'm making coral just with some wavy lines? I'm just making wavy lines. Just some wavy lines on there. Just kind of woo. <laughs> woo. Just get a little crazy with it here. I've got some dark now in front of it, and it looks like it's in front of what I did there. Now you see how I have dark lines over the light lines? That makes it look like these dark pieces are in front, and the light pieces are in back. And you see how that makes it look like it's like it's it's dimensional, right? So it's looks like some things are closer and some things are farther away. Pretty cool. I think I need some fish swimming around in the background. What do you think? I think I need some fish. Let's see. I don't really have any yellow going on here. Let's put a little bit, a little bit of yellow, huh? Now, I'm going to work the water in this paint a little bit, make it a little thicker. All right, but watch how these, these fish are just going to, they're just little, little, little dabs. Let's make a little school of fish over here. And I just make them with little dabs in my brush like this. Just kind of in the background, little fish. You can give them little tails if you want. Right? I need some different kind of fish. Mm. How about, hmm. oh, I don't know, maybe, a, is this purple? I think this might be purple. Let's make a fish, different kind of fish down here that's a little bigger. Mm. I'm going to make a few of them, huh? That one's going off that way. This one's one up this way. No, so I'm not being too careful. These are just sort of background fish. Let's make one over there. All right. Now, I think we need some seaweed. And I think it should be in the front. Hmm. Let's get a nice, ooh, there's a nice olivey looking green, huh? Let's use that. Yeah. There. See if I can get the focus. There we go. Uh, let's have some. Let's just go ahead and let's just let's just slap it on there. This is just Bob Ross it there. There we go. Just slap it on there. I think it needs to be darker. I really want it to stand out and be in the front and not melt into the coral. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab some of this dark. I don't even know. Is this blue? So it is. Let's, let's do that. Change the color later if I don't like it. This is going to be some seaweed with big leaves on it. Mm. 
needs to be a few of those. I think this is black. I think I need some going over this way. All right, there we go. Lighten them up a little bit here. A little green, yeah, or not. Now here's a fun thing about watercolor. Well, let's say, just for the sake of argument, I go, eh, I feel like that's a little too dark, that black there. Wow. You can kind of pick up paint with the brush. If the brush is dry, huh? watch this, watch. You can pick up the paint, you can put it somewhere else. Look at that. This is still wet. It's little puddles of paint everywhere. And you can just keep taking up paint. Taking up paint. So it looks the way you want. Hmm. Coral and seaweed. Who do you think lives in the sea in coral and seaweed, hmm? What kind of creatures are going to live in there? I have a book to show you about that. Set these things away. I have to clean off my board again. I got paint all over it. We'll let this painting dry. It's quite wet. Very wet. There. There we go. I'm gonna clean off this board so I can show you this book. It's another favorite book of mine by another favorite author, Eric Carl. This book is called Mr. Seahorse. I wanted you to notice the kind of artwork that Eric Carl does. I'll show you this book. Mr. Seahorse by Eric Carl, and he did the pictures too. Do you notice how the colors are kind of swooshed on each other here? He uses wet on wet watercolor to get that effect sometimes. And then you see he does other kinds of painting. And then he cuts shapes out and does a collage. Puts them together to make the picture. Okay, let's see here. I wonder if I wanna make it a little bigger. Oh, that's too big. That looks about right. Mr. and Mrs. Seahorse drifted gently through the sea. Mrs. Seahorse began to wiggle and twist this way and that. It's time for me to lay my eggs, she said. Can I help? asked Mr. Seahorse. Oh, yes, thank you, said Mrs. Seahorse. And she laid her eggs into a pouch on Mr. Seahorse's belly. I'll take good care of our eggs, said Mr. Seahorse. I promise. As Mr. Seahorse drifted gently through the sea, he passed right by a group of trumpet fish hidden in a patch of reeds. Peekaboo, there they are. See how he did on that book he painted? Do you know if you have some Sharpie markers, you could put some marks on a page protector or a Ziploc bag and do some art like that? That's pretty neat. There's those trumpet fish, long and skinny. But before long, Mr. Seahorse met another fish. How are you, Mr. Stickleback? asked Mr. Seahorse. Delighted, replied Mr. Stickleback. I just built a nest and right away, Mrs. Stickleback laid her eggs into it. Now I am taking good care of them until they hatch. Oh, keep up the good work, said Mr. Seahorse and swam on his way. As Mr. Seahorse drifted gently through the sea, he passed right by 
a lionfish hidden behind a coral reef. Oh, there he is. In fourth grade, we studied the lionfish. They're very toxic. Means, they're, means they'll make you sick if you try to touch or eat one. But before long, Mr. Seahorse met another fish. How are you, Mr. Tilapia? asked Mr. Seahorse. Mr. Tilapia couldn't answer. His mouth was full of eggs. I know, I know, said Mr. Seahorse. Mrs. Tilapia laid her eggs. Now you are taking good care of them until they hatch. Mr. Tilapia nodded his head. You must be very happy, said Mr. Seahorse, and swam on his way. As Mr. Seahorse drifted gently through the sea, he passed right by a pair of leaf fish hidden among the seaweed. Hmm. You think these are called leaf fish because they look a lot like leaves. Hmm. But before long, Mr. Seahorse met another fish. How are you, Mr. Curtis? asked Mr. Seahorse. Perfectly fine, replied Mr. Curtis. Mrs. Curtis laid her eggs and I have stuck them on my head. Now I am taking good care of them until they hatch. You are doing a good job, said Mr. Seahorse and swam on his way. As Mr. Seahorse drifted gently through the sea, he passed right by a stonefish hidden behind a rock. There he is. <laughs> but before long, Mr. Seahorse met another fish. How are you, Mr. Pipe? asked Mr. Seahorse. Couldn't be better, replied Mr. Pipe. Mrs. Pipe laid her eggs along my belly. Now I am taking good care of them until they hatch. You should feel proud of yourself, said Mr. Seahorse, and swam on his way. Isn't that nice to see all these dads complimenting each other and making each other feel good? That's good to see. But before long, Mr. Seahorse met another fish. How are you, Mr. Bullhead? asked her Mr. Seahorse. Do we miss a page? No. Nope. <laughs> Tip top replied Mr. Bullhead. Mrs. Bullhead laid her eggs and the eggs hatch. Now I'm babysitting. You are doing a fine job, asked Mr. Seahorse and swam on his way. The time had come for the seahorse babies to be born. Mr. Seahorse wiggled and twisted this way and that. At last the babies tumbled from Mr. Seahorse pouch and swam away. One baby turned around and tried to come back into the pouch. Oh no, said Mr. Seahorse, I do love you, but now you are ready to be on your own. <laughs> the end. Eric Carl wrote on the back of the book, Dear friends, in most fish families, after the mother has laid the eggs, they're left on their own. But there are exceptions such as the seahorse, stickleback, tilapia, Curtis nursery fish, pipefish, bullhead catfish and some others. Not only are the eggs cared for by a parent, but surprise, that parent is the father. This is my story about them. Eric Carl. You guys know any dads that take good care of their kids? I know lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of dads that take very good care of their kids. That's a good story. Well, I hope you had fun hanging out with me today. Maybe you'll be able to paint with me along with one of my videos. And I cannot wait for the next one to do some more. Have a good evening and take care.